My name is Nasty Watson. I'm the Digitisation Project Manager um, for the Alfred Gillett Trust. Um, we are actually the archive and museum for Clark's The Shoemakers. So probably at some point in your life you've worn Clark's shoes, and if you have, we've probably got one of them in our stores. Um, I thought I would give you a bit of a brief background to Clark's and a little look at the sort of digitisation projects that we're undertaking at the moment and then focus in detail on one of them, which is a photography-based one, trying to use um, photography to digitise our museum objects. So, um, these stern-looking fellows here are Cyrus and James Clark. They're the founders of Clark's. Um, in 1825, James was working as an um, apprentice in a sheep rug manufacturing uh, business in Street in Somerset and uh, came across the idea of using the off-cuttings from the rugs that they were making to make slippers. Um, they became very, very popular. His brother came in on the enterprise, and Clark's itself was born. Um, they are a Quaker family, so Clark's has always been a Quaker company, is still majority owned by the family, so we have over 200 years of family history as well as company history that we look after. So, just a bit of... Um, an idea about where we actually are. As you can see, just to orientate you, this is Bristol. We are actually down here in Street, which is a couple of miles away from Glastonbury. Um, that aerial shot there is a shot of Street. The village itself basically was developed by Clarks themselves as a village for the workers, much like Cadbury and Bourneville. So uh, what I've got ringed there is the family home of James, where he actually lived. This is now our shoe museum. This is the sort of factory entrance. All of the buildings that you see around it is where the shoes were designed and built for the last 200 years, up until very, very recently. And finally, up there in the corner is where we're based. That is the Grange. It's um, actually one of the very few things in the street that wasn't built or owned by Clarks. Um, but that is where our archive and stores are. And uh, we have a quite good relationship with the company, obviously on their doorstep, and they use us quite heavily. So, a bit of a strange name, the Alfred Gillett Trust. Um, this is Alfred Gillett, the Darwinian looking figure sitting there. He was actually a cousin of the Clark's um, founders. He was very interested in fossils and history and therefore sort of started up the idea of collecting the company history as well as local history, which is what we've got in our collections. So, We've got an archive, probably about 100,000 archives in it. And we've also got a shoe museum in Street, which is in the process of being redeveloped. It is going to be closed down shortly and reopened, or singing or dancing in a couple of years. A little run through our collections, just to give you an idea of what we've actually got. Um, obviously, we have a lot of shoes, over 25,000 shoes that we know of at the moment. Um, they've been collected over time. We don't have brilliant documentation, so that is a bit of a ballpark figure. Not just clerks, but also competitors, shoes from around the world, shoes from history as well. We have footwear accessories, as you can imagine. Miles of laces, heels, buckles, whatever you can imagine that people attach their shoes, we've got them. Um, the actual models and productions for shoes. So this is a wooden last that shoes are actually built on. We've got 5,000 of those. Uh, you will probably have had your feet done by one of these at some point. <laughs> We've got pretty much every model of this one going, including the X-ray version, which we still don't quite know whether it has been decommissioned and whether it's still radioactive or not. <laughs> We've also got um, a huge point-of-sale collection, so all the adverts and advertisements that Clark's produced pretty much since the 1840s, we've got copies of them. We've got a massive audiovisual collection, um, adverts, films of factory workers doing their um, different things, um, and films of corporate sort of presentations and things like that. We've also got a lot of recordings of neighbours and home away stuck in there, which we think that somebody snuck into the collection at some point. We're carefully weeding those out. Um, as you can imagine, a very interesting and extensive photograph collection as the factory was based in street and has always been based there, we've got a huge sort of variety of very interesting local history. And obviously everybody from the local area worked at Clark's, so we have a lot of family history inquiries looking at this sort of material. We have shoe catalogues. 
well, these go back um, probably to the obviously the 1870s, give lists of prices and styles of shoes going right back to the very early days of when Clark started becoming a national company. Very useful for historians and research, for fashion historians in particular. And obviously the family archives. Um, Clark's being a Quaker family, had very big families. It has always stayed in the family, so at the moment we have about 500 current living members of the Clark's family who are shareholders for the company and who deposit archives with us. So, I've talked a bit about the company. Um, the company itself uses the archive quite heavily. We're on their doorstep, we care for their collections for them. So uh, the majority of it is shoe designers. They come in, they get shoes out of the archive that they like. If the 70s are back in fashion, we'll get them some 70s shoes out and they'll start looking at them and designing and picking, um, picking features from them to use in their samples and designs. We've also got a lot of the marketing and branding people obviously very interested in promoting the fact that Clark's is a very old, old company and that playing on that sort of heritage aspect. You can see there, that was just from the other day, that's Clark Shoes' Facebook page post. They do a lot of archive-inspired shoes where they actually come to us, pick some shoes out and try to recreate them. So uh, we work quite closely with the company in that respect. So, a couple of years ago, they got, got in touch with the company and said that we wanted to start digitising the collection. It's not been stored in the best possible conditions up until very recently when the trust sort of took it over. Um, and we wanted to make it more accessible. I mean, the company jumped on this idea. Um, the company itself, although it's based in street, has got um, businesses all over the world, particularly Asia and America. So obviously, it's very easy for the people in street to come and have a look in our archives and measure the shoes and look at them. But very difficult if you're in Shanghai or Boston to have a quick trip to the archive. So, um, we put forward the idea to digitise the collections, make them available online and, uh, and give access to the company so they didn't have to come to us anymore, they didn't have to travel, we didn't have to get things out of the box every, every day. So, we put in a bid for half a million pounds to the company as, very, as they are commi committed to uh, their heritage and have been supporting us for a very long time, they agreed. Um, we managed to get another 500,000 off them when we realised that we had probably aimed too high at the beginning. So in total, their contribution is £1 million to this project. So we have got, over the next five years, photograph 25,000 shoes, uh, photograph 18,000 pieces of point of sale. That figure rises every week because we're still cataloguing it. We're up to about 2009 at the moment. Um, Digitise 2,500 films and audio recordings. Um, scan and create text searchable PDFs of the shoe catalogues that we showed you earlier, very useful for research. And also the in-house publications, the company newspaper, which has been going since the 1920s. Um, scanning those and actually providing those online as well. Hand in hand with that, we said to them, we can't just go and merrily take photos when we've got nowhere to put them and nowhere to catalogue them. So the other parts of the project which we managed to slip in there was creating our online collections management system. Previously to this, we were using our own version of Access database, which many of you have probably come across in other, in other um, places. Um, not Spectrum standard, not very easy to use. Um, so we decided to move it all over onto Adlib, so we got them to pay for that. Um, repacking and storing the collections in our new archive, making sure that they were actually packaged up properly, stored properly, so they'd last another 200 years. And also the IT infrastructure. When I started, they gave me a computer, a camera, and a 60 gigabyte hard drive and said, digitize the collection. So uh, <laughs> we did a little bit of figuring out and realized that 60 terabytes is the minimum amount of data that we're actually going to create during this project. So obviously, we need safe and secure storage all of that. Here's a bit of a look at our time scale. We're trying to do a collection a year, um, apart from the shoes, which obviously is going to take significantly longer to do. We've already done the audiovisual collection. That's been digitised externally and is back with us now and ready to go onto our servers. The shoes are in progress. We've done three decades. We've got another ten to go. Um, 
searchable database for the company is going to go online and integrate it into their intranet system so that they can access it using their company logon details and things. Um, shoe catalogues and the in-house publications in 2016. Then the point of sale is going to take us two years because it's so extensive. And then finally, the little bits of audiovisual stuff that we found hiding after we got everything back from being digitised. So, quite an intense period of work for us. Um, we're a very small team, there's only 10 of us. There was three when I started two years ago. There's 10 of us now to try and get all of this done in the amount of time that we've got. So, I will quickly tell you some of the digitisation projects we've got and then I'll focus on the shoe digitisation project because that's really the one where we're trying to give people that idea of actually what items look like and how to access them remotely. So, the audiovisual um, collection, about 2,500 items in that. Um, like I said before, adverts and uh, films like manufacturing processes, some very lovely early films of um, piece workers who worked at home making shoes themselves, cobblers actually repairing shoes, things that we don't actually do anymore. Um, after digitisation, we're sending them down to Plymouth to the Southwest Film and Television Archive for storage. Um, that's because we've obviously got um, various um, cellulose acetate and vinegar syndrome and all the sorts of nasty things that you get with having stored um, film collections that we haven't really, we're not really set up to look after. So they're going into cold storage in Plymouth. Um, and through that, um, organisation will be made available to the public to actually access as well. Um, and obviously, at the end, we will do the final bits that we found, which we really can't leave out. And that project itself was done by a company called Deluxe in London um, and cost us £57,000 to do. Or cost Clark's £57,000 to do. Um, the shoe catalogues, we are going to be <coughs> scanning those and creating text searchable PDFs. Um, a lot of the work that we do with the shoes is based on the name of the shoe and the range names of the shoe. Um, so that's where the OCR work will help us. Um, we've got a company that we're just in the final stages of commissioning to do that for us, so that's being done externally as well. Um, it's going to cost us about 25 pence per page once you've got the PDF of it, the high-resolution TIFF scan of it, and an OCR document that we can use. It's the same process for The Courier, the local newspaper, which was going from about 1924. It's been replaced now by internal emails, which isn't quite as exciting, and which we can only print out, basically, and store on our servers. But um, the newspapers have a great amount of local information in there. And again, same company, hopefully, they'll be doing that. And that's the price there. Point of sale. Um, we are going to be photographing that in-house. Um, 20,000 items to do. We're going to rattle through those quite quickly. It's a lot easier to photograph those than it is for the shoes, as you'll see in a minute. Um, but obviously, the cost of getting a photographer, all the studio equipment and time that it takes to do all of that is quite, ex quite expensive, so £98,000 for that. So, this is what we're faced with on a daily occurrence at work. We actually do do this with our shoes, where we have to line them all up and try and theme them into boxes at the end of the day. Um, they can feel a bit like you're drowning in shoes. Uh, <laughs> so, the shoe digitisation project. I thought I'd give you 10 steps to digitising a shoe. Um, as I said, the company gave me a camera, a hard drive and a computer. They said, get on with it. We said, there's a bit more to digitisation than just taking a photo. So, there's a lot of work that goes on before you even start a digitisation project to make sure that you've got everything right before you start. It's a lot of money that you're investing and you don't want to create something which you can't use in a couple of years' time. So, the key part of that was actually developing the standards to which we were going to be working at, particularly digitisation standards. Making sure that we choose the right file types to use, that we convert to the right formats and store in the right places, um, so that the files don't go obsolete in a couple of years and we can't access them. Making sure that the documentation that went alongside it was good and accurate. Um, we have very poor documentation up to now. We have, I checked the other day, about a thousand records for black shoe in our collection. So if you're trying to find a black shoe, <laughs> you've got lots to choose from. If you're trying to find a particular black shoe, you're very unlikely to actually find it. So developing the documentation standards to make sure that all the incorrect information was, was collected. 
working out how people had been documenting these shoes. They've been collected for over 200 years, and every single person who was in charge of them developed their own numbering system and their own storage system and hierarchies. So uh, basically, getting rid of everything that had gone before, <coughs> renumbering everything to spectra of standard, retitling and putting all the metadata into the items. And also, um, what we're actually doing packing-wise, you wouldn't think that shoes are difficult to pack, but uh, there's a lot of things to worry about. high heel shoes in particular like to wobble around. Um, there's a lot of hazardous materials that were used in the production of shoes, which we didn't realise when we started. Asbestos was commonly used in early shoe production. Also, polyurethane, which uh, has a tendency to crumble. So if you've got any Clark shoes from the 70s or 80s, you'll probably notice they don't have soles anymore, and they're falling to pieces. So it was very important for us to make sure that all the staff that were working on the project understand what the hazards are dealing with them, understand how they're supposed to be recording them, and making sure that we are trying as best as possible to future-proof ourselves. So, next step, documentation. We built our own shoe cataloguing tab on our CMS system, Adlib. Um, this tab basically has all of the key bits of information that we know that we need to record if we were doing an incredibly detailed record for a shoe. Um, it means that at the end of the day, we will be able to search on anything from heel size and type to uh, factory of manufacture, last number that it was built on, things like that. All that information goes into the Adlib database straight away. So at the beginning, before Adlib was ready, we were all doing it handwritten and retyping it up. Now we've got Adlib, we can just do it all straight into there. Cleaning them, uh, there's a polyurethane shoe, so you can see what I mean about the, uh, yeah, 70 shoes don't last. <laughs> um, creating a condition report for them, making sure that we note all of the structural, chemical, biological, physical damage on the shoe at the time that we were looking at it. This is hopefully going to help us chart how these shoes degrade over time. If you've got a pair of 1940s Clark shoes, you will still be able to wear them. <laughs> so, materials have changed over time, and the length of time that things like this last has also changed. Um, very simple <coughs> cleaning procedure, brushing, vacuuming, and applying museum wax, if necessary. So, one that we didn't really think about at the time, but has become obvious, is isolation. Bugs love shoes, apparently. They love um, fleece-lined things, they love fur, they love leather. Um, so we have quite a problem with the fact that up until recently our shoes were stored in a, essentially a barn that had a river running through the middle of it. Um, so now they have to be bagged up when we notice them crawling with things and freezer treated to make sure that everything's taken out of it before it gets anywhere near the photography table. Um, repacking them, taking them out of, as you can see, the original shoe boxes wrapped in lovely black acidy tissue paper which likes to leave stains all over the things that we've got. Um, so taking them out, putting them into proper acid-free boxes, acid-free tissue, silica gel in there to make sure that we can suck as much moisture out that they've gathered over time, and having them looking nice and ready and clean for photography. So now we get to digitization. This is actually the point that Clarks are interested in. The shoes that we are taking pictures of, we are taking seven, minimum seven shots of the shoe. We're taking them from both sides, top and bottom, so you can have a look at this insole, um, the heel and the toe, and also what we like to call the cover shot. I don't imagine that shoe's ever going to get on the cover of a magazine, but it's the one that the uh, branding department and marketing departments like the best. Um, the reason that we have gone down this route is that um, one of the primary focus of the use of this is going to be Clark's designers. I've seen them sitting there counting the stitches on the side of a shoe to figure out how many stitches are on that seam. Um, they need to have quite, in, quite good detail of the shoes that we're actually, um, that shoes we're actually taking, so they can do that. And we don't want to keep pulling them out of storage all the time. So we're trying to take it from every angle and trying to do it in as good a detail as possible so they can zoom in. At the beginning, we were doing detail shots where we were actually zooming in, but we realized that the camera that we're using and the setup that we've got is so good that zooming on these shots is good enough. We don't need to do that extra step. And when you times that by 25,000, you realize, well, we probably don't have enough time to do everyone in great detail. 
So, just a look at a couple of the ones that we've done so far. We've done the 40s to the 60s, um, chosen because they were in the best condition out of the whole collection. There are a couple of earlier ones in there. That one in the centre is 1890s. It's got an elastic side, so you can see how it's all degrading. Um, we've also got men's collections. So, some of paint-spattered sandals. A brute, that boot on the end there, which is called the Justin, which I quite like. <laughs> And some nice 1970s Hardy Amy inspired um, boots, Chelsea boots. And obviously children's, people always think about, associate Clarks with children's shoes and that's why um, they were famous for their children's shoes. Um, they are the most, the prettiest ones I think in the collection and also the ones that the um, branding department like the best. So, the digitization done, this is just a look at the processing of the actual files once we've got them. So obviously we are shooting in RAW, so you're getting the full amount of data that we can from the camera. Um, once that gets to us, we rename that for, into our archival master file. This is the one that's being stored for long term. It's not going to be accessed so it doesn't degrade um, and get compromised. And it gets converted into a DNG, which is a digital negative. Um, we chose that just because that seems like the, seems like the one that everybody's leaning towards in, in digitization. It's supposed to be basically accessible to people long term and supported. So that's what our archival master files that are being stored deep in our servers are, are in. Then we add the metadata to so that and convert it to a TIFF. The TIFF is basically the production master file, the one that we are actually using day to day to create copies. Um, it's the one that's accessible to the staff as well. This TIFF gets checked for colour, light balance, any stray bits of hair that appear on the, uh, on the picture that we didn't see when we were taking the photograph, that all gets edited um, and gets renamed as the production master file. The final step, converting that production master file into a JPEG. Um, this is a low resolution derivative file. This is what goes onto our ad lib system as, as a thumbnail. Um, it's nice and small, so it doesn't take up space, doesn't too much space and means that people aren't going to steal it off our online system and use that instead of coming to us and getting the best quality version. Storage, things go into store. We've got colour-coded labels to identify the gender, the shoes that are in there, the makers. And we're storing them by decade um, just so we can uh, actually quickly zoom locate what we actually need to find. Um, obviously updating, making sure our location and movement control is up to date so we actually know where to find things. So now instead of having the barn as a location, we have got a box number, a shelf number, bay number, and strong room number. Um, uploading, the pictures actually then get put onto AdLib. So that's our final step in our project really. Um, attaching those low resolution JPEGs that I mentioned earlier um, onto the records themselves so that uh, minimize the amount of storage space we're taking up on our online server with all of those, and every single image we take gets linked to it. So the idea being that when somebody at Clark's is sitting at their desk, they will be able to search for a shoe by whatever theme they want to search for, get their selection, look at their record, and get multiple images of that shoe from every angle. They can get all of the object history information from that, and then hopefully at the end, they don't need to come and see the shoe itself. We can leave it safely in storage um, so it doesn't degrade any further. So, that is the digitization project. <laughs>